sleds out there and uh, after the ceremony uh, Mark Melangia had restored my 77 TX he turned it into a 75 PDC clone that's out there and uh, we're gonna unveil that after the ceremony so that'll be fun for me because I haven't seen it yet <laughs> and uh, I thank uh, the board members Greg Allen Shane Beatty, Bob Clark, uh, Greg Westcott, I don't know if any of you guys are here, but I, I know uh, Bob Clark is, and Greg. Greg is our cameraman, he's over there. Uh, thank Mike LaPierre for coming. Uh, Mike thinks he might have a vintage show coming up in August, August 10th, up in, on Derby Line, Vermont. So, uh, hopefully we can be there too for that. And uh, I want to thank my wife, Linda, and uh, certainly she's been a big force in, in helping me on this deal. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming here, Cal Reynolds and his wife, Mary Ann, Bruce Borovide, <laughs> last year's inductees, Laura Salon and his wife, and uh, Ed Staff. Thank you very much for coming back. And uh, I think with that, we got to thank Rick Simula. Well, I don't know if you people have been on this Facebook thing. It was new to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never thought I'd ever do Facebook. Do My wife great. does. And uh, Rick Simula uh, tried to get me on Facebook for a year or two now. And he said, you got to get on there, that Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame. He said, you got to get on there. And uh, I said, you and Paul started this thing, and he said, it would be nice to have you on. Well, you know, guess what? I, I can't get off it now. <laughs> There's a name for that. I, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting there on the computer, what, seven, eight hours seven, a day? Eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, it's so much fun. <laughs> Snowbear Racing Hall of Fame page, Facebook page, Rick Simeon started it. He's over, hey Rick, come over here. You and your wife, Karen. Did a great job, man. I'm telling you. Thank you. This is Rick. He used to race snowmobiles for 11 years ago, and, uh, and now he's uh, just a regular guy. <laughs> wife are here, there's Leon. He told me not to say anything, but I'm not going to <laughs> Leon's done a great job. He's helped us out on the on the uh, cyberspace there on the uh, emails back and forth and uh, a lot of suggestions and everything comes his way and we really appreciate that. Uh, and Mark Melanger, I don't know where Mark is, but I know he is. There, there he is. There he is. <laughs> Mark's here and he brought uh, the sled outside, uh, it's the uh, Roberts Motors clone yeah. of, uh, of a Skidoo that Roberts Motors, they used to race them back years ago, 1968 Skidoo. Correct. And that's setting outside and it's exactly from this wall here to the back of that sled, 67 feet 6 inches. So if you want to open that door, and back up to this wall and look out through there. That's how far Bob Fortin jumped on a sled with three inches of suspension travel. <laughs> I mean, kids today, 
jump that far every lap. <laughs> it's a snow cross thing. But when you when you look at that sled and then see how far that thing jumped back in 1967, do. <laughs> We're gonna come with that. So uh, and uh, Paul Crank. Does anybody know that 60 years ago, Paul Crane was the first guy to ride a skidoo snowmobile in town of Lancaster? And not only that, America. He's the first guy to ride a Paul. I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs of the story that I that I wrote here. I'm going to need my glasses. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I write a little article in this uh, Northwoods Weekly and uh, a couple of weeks ago I wrote about this uh, ceremony, this induction ceremony and uh, this is what I started with. It says at 7 a.m. on Saturday, May 20th, 2017, 78-year-old Paul Crane drove down to a snowmobile museum, unlocked the front door, grabbed his open flag, walked back up the long driveway to Main Street, and hung it under his sign. But this was just no ordinary day for Crane Snowmobile Museum, for on this day, Paul would begin a new chapter in his lifelong service to the snowmobile and snowmobile racing by inducting into the newly formed Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame our top first generation snowmobile racers from the golden era, the ones who started it all. Over 50 years ago, the ones who began racing on seven horsepower machines almost 60 years ago and ended 20 years later driving world class 100 plus horsepower ice racers at speeds of over 100 miles an hour. Yes, folks, these once young men and women believed that no one remembered them or remembered that exciting time in our history. They believed too much time had passed since the sport was brand new and the excitement was at a fever pitch. All that was left from this period were faded black and white photos faded film, and faded memories. Fifty people showed up to watch our first induction of four racing pioneers. It took all of 30 minutes to cover over 50 years of a sport that was once so important. Even our governors came to the Grand Prix on Sunday. A state of New Hampshire declaration was issued each year designating Grand Prix Week. In 2018, our crowd size doubled as we inducted five more racing pioneers. But sadly, we also had a moment of silence for one of our original four, Mr. Conrad Rollins, who had passed away six months earlier. Oh, how I wish we had thought of doing this years ago. It's another race now, it gets time. And uh, the guy that owns the place, Mr. Paul Crane, is as much of a legend as anybody. It says so right there. <laughs> He's also a member of the Hall of Fame out in uh, Eagle River, up there on the wall. So uh, I congratulate Paul Crane for 60 years of service to the snowmobile. Well, we're going to begin. Um, Mr. Bob Fortin. Robert Fortin inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame 2019. 
Bob's first race was at the 1964 International Grand Prix. He won Class C at the 1966 Grand Prix and was the second person to have his name on the then new and now famous Kilkenny Cup. Fulton won the prestigious 1966 Maine State Championship by taking three firsts and two seconds in front of a standing room only hometown crowd. Bob set a world jump record of 67 feet 6 inches at the 1967 Grand Prix. And like I say, you open that door out there, you can see how far that, that is on that, on that little sled. Bob won the 1969 New Hampshire State Championship in Wolfboro. He became team captain of the famed Big T Racing Team, sponsored by Skidoo Distributor Timberland Machines Incorporated. In 1970, Bob won the Balsams Cup, the Kilkenny Cup, Vermont's Exits Grand Prix. He won in Mod 1 at Lewiston, Mod 2 at Bangor, and was nearly unbeatable in Mod 1 and Mod 2 classes during both 1970 and 71 seasons. Well on his way to another very successful year of racing, it took a mid-season accident while testing one of his new sleds to sideline Fortin for the remainder of the 1972 season, and I'm going to tell you something. That was the year they had those little baby triples. Bob Fort would have been number one had he been able to race that year, I guarantee it. <laughs> Wearing gold bib numbers two and three during his ten years of racing, Bob Fortin was a stickler for perfection and is widely regarded as the greatest New England skidoo racer of his generation. Mr. Bob Fortin. Another gentleman I want to introduce that is going to say a few words about Bob <laughs> and uh, last year's inductee. And uh, his name, his plaque had been put on the wall more than five minutes when I felt his arm come around my shoulder. And he whispered, he says, uh, Bob Fortin needs to be up on that wall. And I explained to him how, uh, you know, we're trying to do the ones that's still with us first and, and, and uh, eventually we'll do the ones that have passed away. And he shakes his head and he says, you know, he says, Bob needs to be up there more sooner than later. Um, I know why this guy is, is so big. <laughs> he has to carry around a big heart. <laughs> Mr. Calvin Reynolds. <laughs> okay. Did everybody hear me? Can you hear me okay, buddy? Oh, it's good. Okay, pull yourself together. <laughs> <laughs> First time I ever raced a real race on a small deal was at Lancaster. And we pulled in there with just one, I, I, I must have been a 64, because we were, there was, was part of the participants were still there, four cycle engines, color engines, and wooden skis. But anyway, it didn't take me, I was racing at Beechwood at the time, racing cars. Can everybody hear me? No. <coughs> Can't hear me? Yeah. Okay, at the time I was racing cars at Beechwood Speedway, and I lost, no, I haven't started racing motorcycles yet, but I was racing cars. And so I had a little, I know I was, I'm pretty confident when I come up there from the Flatlands on that little six, six hostile with this canoe. And uh, we no more pulled in and unloaded it and I looked around and I could see who was going to be the competition. Because there was one guy riding around in, on his knees and he was, a, he, when he had the confidence and he had it all covered. He had all, I mean the guy was really, really sharp and on the stick and on the ball. And, I mean, he was everywhere. I think he was 19 years old. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he was over here, and he was over there, and I was over here, and I said, man, 
<laughs> and here I am from the flatlands. So anyway, I think we had to weigh 200 pounds. The machine, the rider had to weigh 200 pounds. I weighed 190 with Smallville suit and all that. They added weight. So they added weight my, <laughs> my glove box, sandbags, and the glove box. <laughs> when they, everybody's running around making a lot of noise. And I said, man, they're making a lot of noise. It must be going faster. So I took the muffler off my machine, and I haven't heard anything since. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, you take the noise coming out of that cab, coming back on you, and I think the cross country was like six miles. By the time I get back for three days, I <laughs> so I got back to the shop down in Buxton, and we were Scadudo, and uh, I took off, I got the machine out one next morning, and I took off across the field, and well, I'm a big racer now, so I'm be racing, I hit a bum, I was there like that, and the glove box come open, and it fell on my face. <laughs> 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 I got <laughs> Bobby won it all. <laughs> so, but one, the guy, we, I think Dave Pickett, I'm going to name on him, El Capitan. El yeah. Capitan. Yeah. Is, that, is that right, Bobby? Yep. El, Dave Pickett. Yep. And, uh, right, Bruce? And we got whatever whatever we wanted, we had to get it from Bruce. I mean, from uh, Bobby. And uh, <laughs> Bobby was very generous with it, the information. Very generous. And he passed it down to us guys. And you always talked about my machines, how they were good and clean and everything, because I had to yeah. emulate Bob. His machines were spotless. <laughs> Ten-time machines were spotless. Well, one year, I got promised the will from Nero Distributors to ride out a cat. They were going to give me machines, on, and they wooed me in with big time. So I jumped ship and went out of cab. And uh, before I got done, I was on my hands and knees in front of Bill Sawin's desk. Taking that machine. I was really no I got right on my hands and knees and said, please help. Give me this right. Anyway, I think the next race, Bobby get hurt. I'm back to mine. And uh, the 640 was ready to go, nobody had to ride it. So they told me to ride it. And uh, at Bangor. And you remember the race up there? And Tom Peters remembers the race because he's the guy that I kept looking down and saying, Where'd that stream to come from? <laughs> go away. And I rode the bags all the way around and I won the race that anyway, Bobby's machine. And uh, that was a, uh, I mean, he was the leader. He would. He set the pace of everybody. He set the. He set the. Uh, the high marks. The high marks. And we all wanted to follow it. Yeah. And that's why my machines are always spotless. That's why we always rode with decent clothes. And we try to look better than Timberland, which is hard to do. They got this one. That was sharp. <laughs> but I will say one thing. Timberland did give me two years in a row. Give me four machines to race with my own riders. And I know they did that with Bobby's blessing. Because if Bobby hadn't said okay, I would have never got it. So anyway, yeah. the guy who deserves to be up there, and he should have been in the first year. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anyway, well done. By the way, uh, David Fawson has got some kill candy cups in his own. Thanks to Mark Legend. <laughs> <laughs> the apple doesn't fall very fast from the tree. Thanks, <laughs> Chris. into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame 2019. He began racing in 1970 on local upstate New York tracks. Ron was offered a factory production Thunderjet 440 in 1972. Had highest points for any Thunderjet in Mod 3 in USSA East. Began racing rough in later Attic Cat for the legendary team of bowl in 1973. Ron is still the only driver to win the Adirondack Cup twice. He won a Kilkenny Cup in Mod 1 at the 1975 Lancaster Grand Prix and took first place in Mod 3 at the 1975 World Series. 
He still holds the record for most USSA points ever in one season. <coughs> Rob Hall still holds a record 15 straight feature wins in Mod 1. He wore gold bibs number 1, 3, 4, 8, and 22 <coughs> during his racing career. In 1977, while racing in five different classes, Ron took 22 first place, 12 second, 7 third place, and 7 fourth place finishes. Ironically, in only his first year of racing in stock, Ron broke a spindle crashing into the wall at Eganville, Ontario, Canada on February 5, 1977, ending his amazing career and left the sport with over 150 first, second, and third place trophies in just seven years of racing. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ron Hall. Yeah, if I could have just a few minutes of your time, yeah, I'm trying to think, you know, this week what I might say to everyone here, but uh, I'd like to honor some names, say some names that through my career that helped me out, just voice their name in this, this uh, uh, Hall of Fame here, if you bear with me. Uh, my early years, and I started out that I never sat on a snowmobile until I was 27 years old. <laughs> I started in with a, my boss, uh, the Courier Corporation, was a part of a dealership in Syracuse, and uh, Phil Richardson and his bro uh, brother-in-law uh, had a dealership in, uh, in Syracuse there. They sold, you know, the heyday of snowmobiles, they sold 1,500 new units a year back then, you know, and you go to, <clears throat> when you went to Boondale and stuff, you would have 5,000 or better spectators, you'd have 880 entries, you know, it, it was, you know, everybody here knows it was, it was big back then, you know, and then uh, I got a ride with this snow jet there the next year, and uh, Ronnie Cornell, and, uh, Vern Conway, Aero Marina, and Night of Lake. And then from that, the next year, Bill Abel uh, called me up and wanted me to run a RUP. <clears throat> and, you know, a good deal with RUP. It took us a while to get it figured out, but uh, it turned out to be a good, good year with the RUP. And uh, then that, that started our, it, he was sponsoring it through A&P Auto Parts. That's what he owned. And from there, we went on, that was the beginning of Able Racing, Able Team, Team Able Racing. And uh, from there, uh, you know, Herb Yancey, Chip Elwood, and I <clears throat> were racing, and all these names that I'm gonna mention now are names that helped all three of us. And it's um, uh, Charlie Hemans and Al Conklin and my wife's uncle was our best man. He died at 42 with cancer. He was down helping me about every night down to my house. And uh, that, and then of course Bill, you know, he, you know, he worked <laughs> night and day. He's still he's still racing. Uh, he's 81, 82 years old. He's still racing in Star. Uh, super modified cars. He's got two grandsons that are still racing. He's still still doing it today. I don't know how how he does it. You know? And uh, and another person I want to mention is my head cheerleader, my daughter. And, uh, then I got this gal that's been following me around here for 57 years. <laughs> Anybody that's been in the race, and you know, it's hard on the marriage life. You know, but she runs with us just about every week. 
Ron's wife. And our two, <laughs> and our two children, too. We yeah. did it a family deal. And, and our son. Yeah, yeah. And my son, he's got a thumb that's bent right backwards from building tracks. Yeah. <laughs> really, you're short. I've never seen anybody can bend a thumb backwards, but he does it. You know? Well, I, I sure appreciate this, and I appreciate you guys having a but this here, it's, it's just a marvelous idea, you know, it brings back a lot of nice memories to everybody, you know. Nice. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Terry, Terry, would you go up and take a picture, please, so we can take a picture of you two? Now? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ron brought up a good point about the lady, the wives. Uh, these guys will tell you they couldn't have done it without them. Um, they're, you know, they're the real heroes in this whole thing. Yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Claude Heber. <laughs> Claude Heber, racer promoter, inducted into the Eastern Snow and Beer Racing Hall of Fame 2019. Claude's exceptional racing talent in the early 1960s was noticed by a local covert motor ski dealer who then hired him as their driver. He was soon invited to race for the Eastern Motor Ski Distributor, Rockwell Incorporated. It was here that Claude not only became New England sales manager for Rockwell, but worked closely with the Motor Ski Factory on engine development to increase horsepower and was involved in the many rule requirements for racing. His role in production testing and new model development, along with a full racing schedule, each season contributed greatly to Motor Ski's success. When Rockwell Distributor ceased as a distributor for snowmobiles, Claude accepted the job as New England Regional Manager for Snowjet, now owned by Kawasaki Motors. Claude was soon promoted to na as National International Sales Manager and involved in, in the Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he was involved in production testing, product development, and was involved in the development and promotion of the TOC Tournament of Champions. In 1969, on an icy Sunday morning at the Lancaster <laughs> Grand Prix racetrack, snowmobile racer Claude Hewlett, driving a 634 motor ski, got into a first turn skirmish with a knotted cat rider and delivered to the snowmobile racing world the first real glimpse of the element of danger to this new sport. <laughs> always be remembered as the guy who cut off a telephone pole. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I never saw the pole. <laughs> because I thought I could use the berm and get around. <laughs> My three-cornered file was in a hole. <laughs> so I was going up to the berm, and then I see all these kids and people behind the fence. I thought, oh my God, <laughs> that's where I'm going. <laughs> Next thing I knew when I came to, I was paralyzed, I was blind, and I thought, what in the hell happened? Somebody grabbed my foot, and I could feel it. I said, shit, I'm not paralyzed. <laughs> so I was right between the snowbank and the fence. They pulled me out of there, I'm still blind, I turned my helmet around. <laughs> I still didn't know what happened. <laughs> the pole was on the track, and my motor skis upside down on the fence. What? Well, I never saw the pole. <laughs> that was the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> and then they got my sled out, and I realized 
tell him my brake cable was broke. I couldn't slow down anyway. Yep. <laughs> so that was my day. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here and to accept this on behalf of the telephone pole and lunch. <laughs> They took him to the hospital, checked him out, he came back that same day and started racing again. <laughs> I didn't go very fast, but my brake cable was still broken. <laughs> oh. Claude, Claude is still promoting, though. Claude has been instrumental in helping us find these different racers and everything the last couple of years on the internet. Uh, he's, he's all the time looking for people, and he's, he's been very helpful, so Claude's okay. always doing something for us. Okay. I want to thank Rick Simula for the work he's done in developing the site, and that has brought together so many of the races and names from yesterday that we had all long forgotten, and all of a sudden, the stories they come out with and the memory these guys have is just unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bruce Don't Wilbur, ask them what they had for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Wurlbach can tell you every race he was ever in and what position he was in. You know, who remembers that stuff? <laughs> so, uh, thank you and uh, for Paul Crane and you, Ed, for all yeah. the work you've done in that. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. You know, when you talk about Bruce, uh, I was telling somebody, uh, Bruce was probably in your 20s when you were racing, right, Bruce? Uh, that's pretty hard to forget. Now, Bruce became an electrician, and he was an electrician for most of his life. But he never had five and 6,000 people watching him twist wires together. <laughs> He never had anybody come out and ask him for their autograph while he was doing electrical work. But they did when he was younger, and that's what you're going to remember. Jay, I told you. Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame 2019. J.I. began racing in 1967, retiring 13 years later in 1980. After soundly beating Skidoo distributor, racing juggernaut, Timberland Machines, J.I. was approached by team captain Bob Fortin, who demanded that he begin racing for them. <laughs> he wore gold bibs number 2, 7, 10, and 15 during his racing career. A conservative estimate of 200 first, second, and third place trophies were garnered during his 13 years of racing. He set track speed records both at Jackman and Scarborough, Maine, which held for 10 years and 8 years respectively. Was a member of both the USSA Drivers Committee from 1974 to 1979 and was on the USSA Board of Directors from 1976 to 1978. Toja won back-to-back -back Kilkenny Cups at the 1975 Lancaster Grand Prix, taking first place in both Mod Stock 3 and Super Mod 3. J.R. garnered enough USSA points each racing season to compete at six World Series events, taking a couple of third-place finishes and a couple of fifth-place finishes. During the 1976 Lancaster Grand Prix, J.R. not only won a Kilkenny Cup in Mod Stock 2, but grabbed second place in Super Mod 2, beat only by Gilles Villeneuve on his revolutionary IFS Skrull. If he hadn't shown up with that Skrull, he'd have cleaned house that year. <laughs> I got a few things to say. Calvin kind of rained on my plate in some of it. <laughs> I want to let you all know I'm very honored and feel very privileged to be here today. And I think we all should uh, 
take a look at a couple guys here and whoever else helps them that they have uh, they've started something really great you know this Eastern Division was uh, as far as I know included uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York and Pennsylvania and if somebody come out of New Jersey, I guess so too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I didn't know if Ohio was in there or not. But the reason these pictures are on the wall and there's a lot more coming as the years go on is because of these guys right here. You know, other than one guy, the rest of us have never been in the Hall of Fame of some of the bill races. And that guy will soon be up here talking to you, I guess. But anyway, I just want to take my hat off to these guys. I want you guys to know how much and I'm sure I'm speaking for everybody, how much we appreciate all the work that you guys have done to well, make this all you. happen for us. <laughs> well, it's my last hurrah, so I got a little story to tell. And it's, I'm telling this story because I want to recognize someone that was uh, very close to me on and off the track as time went on. It's kind of a funny story how we started, but... Uh, I started racing, as I said, in 67, just my, myself and my dad, and he was a big part of it for eight or nine years there. He was always with me working, and he came up with some stuff that I would shake my head at, head at but it usually worked. But anyway, race ski rolled in 67, had a cat for two or three years, never raced out into getting, going out to sanction points or anything. But as time went on, uh, we had a flare from Nelson and Small, uh, 340, and we done quite well with it, but we didn't get enough points to go to the World Series. So that March in '72, I guess it would be, we went to uh, Ellsworth, Maine. We done a few things to the to the chassis and some ski tricks, and let's go down and see what's going to do. But uh, unbeknown to us, the big yellow truck was there. Uh, Bob Martin, uh, Bob Porton, and Calvin Reynolds was there. They all tuned it out. I don't know if you were there that weekend or not, Bruce, but there's a reason why I'm telling the story, so. Uh, uh, yeah, the, I think so. <laughs> yeah. We were, they were getting ready to go to World Series. They were just there to test. But we were playing on something that probably we would try to use next year, because, you know, our season was over. But anyway, as the day went on, my, my stuff was working pretty good. And uh, as everybody knows, Bob Fortin is, he was the best back in the 250, 340, 650 classes at that time, and uh, mine was a 340. Well, I didn't have anywhere near the sled he had, but we had our trucks working pretty good for us. And he, to make a long story short, we got to the final, and uh, we hadn't met yet. I didn't even know Bob Ford, and he didn't know me, of course. But uh, in that final race, I, my stuff was, I was handling good enough so that I could buy him. And I, in the turn, but he'd blow me away in the straightaways. But anyway, I ended up getting the win. And uh, of course, my father and I, we were pretty happy, but we just beat Bob Porton. Nobody beats Bob Porton. <laughs> <laughs> we locked out and got it done. <laughs> so anyway, we thought we'd done great things. We was loading the sled, and the tech man came over, and he says, uh, told you, you got to bring the sled to tear down. He said, well, this is the last race of the year. I'm not going to the World Series. No, there's a guy here, a pretty proud guy, he says, and he wants you to tow down, but you ain't gonna let nobody help you. No, no, the maid come down here and beat his ass. That's just the way the sick man said it. So. Well, they tore me down, and uh, Bob was standing there, and he didn't say a word to me. But, uh, so they got the big truck up, and we were proven, okay, we were legal. And away went the big truck, and uh, I was standing with my father, and now we gotta take it put the cylinders back on, put the head back on, and throw the clutch back on it, because they checked everything. So they put a little burr in my saddle, about Mr. Fortin at that time. <laughs> and again, I'm telling the story for a reason. <laughs> so the next year, Nelson and Small uh, wasn't going to have Polaris, so they asked if we would run the, the uh, Chaparral. So they gave me a 650 Chaparral, built especially for the drag. So we, uh, we had a good season, but, but the last one was right here in Lancaster. So, uh, you come down here, and you know, everything's all yellow down here. <coughs> well, the Timberland machine was right there. So, Ford and I still hadn't spoken a word to each other. And uh, again, we got lucky. I beat him in the 650, 
and I got over the 800 with my 650. And now we're really fun. Kyle and I, and we lay on for you. We're, we're doing well. Yeah, take that. You know, like well, we're loading the loading machine again, and here he comes walking across the airstrip up here. And he says, uh oh, it's going to be a teardown. So you know. <laughs> he walked over and he shook my hand. He said, hey, I want to congratulate you on the day. There wasn't much red stuff here, and you, you know, hey, you beat us fair square. And I said, well, thank you. And he says, uh, the other guy from Ellsworth, from last from March, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> and I still had that burr. <laughs> Why are you turning me down? <laughs> so he said, I got to talk to you. Which brings us into a light, in light here. I said, what about? He said, well, we think we want you to ride with us next year. And I said, well, you know something? I don't know you very well. But we're all, we've been off on the wrong foot here a little bit. And I said, I'd rather ride something red or black or something like that and be able to beat you that one in if I can. <laughs> he said, oh, everybody's trying that. <laughs> anyway, we went to the race shop. He gave me a week. And I ended up being with Bob Fortin and Tim Blair Machines and Bob Matton and Calvin. And we all run the same equipment. And the point, this is where I'm getting to the point. Bob Fortin had a hard job to do. He was a race director for Timberland. He raced against us. And he also was a, our boss. In fact, in regards to getting packs and all that stuff that you need if you're going to race. And uh, Bob Fortin was one of the big reasons why I'm here, and Timberland Machine is why I'm here today. Because I couldn't go do all that. I, I just couldn't, uh, couldn't afford it. I had four kids at home. If I didn't have the back of what Timberland Machine gave me, and Bob Fortin being the boss of all of that. Uh, Jay, I told you probably wouldn't be receiving this today. So I'm, I just want you to know, uh, and him and I became good friends too. We used to go down and visit the summer once in a while. And whenever he was in Bangor at the other Timberland Machine, he'd always stop at the house and talk and we had a beer or two or whatever. You know, uh, Bob Fortin to me was the reason I'm here. Well, I do have to add in, Alouette was very good. Uh, I did get a number two out of that. But, and Mercury was good. It seems so every time I turned around, one was going bankrupt. They're going yeah. out of business, not building anymore. So yeah. Skidoo went out in 75 because of the gas guns. And uh, I continued on with uh, Alouette and Mercury through those years. But when Skidoo came back into it again, I got another call from Bob Ford. So I had to speak highly about Bob Ford because he called me back and they get back into racing again. <laughs> And I didn't say no. We didn't have no talking over there in the, in the race deck. I said, yes, sir, I'll be right down. <laughs> he, he was one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. He was a, he was he, a good he friend really of me. Was. And he was, he really uh, was. The job he had to do, I thought he was quite fair. Yeah, no, yeah. He, he, was, uh, he was a good friend of a lot of people here in town. And uh, he used to hang out at Dick's, and Bob used to hang out at Dick's. And, <laughs> They all hung out, and uh, I was surrounded by legends of the sport, and at that time didn't really know it. They were like more like brothers to me than anything else. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll tell you one thing: all Bob could talk about was Jay. I told you this, and Jay. I told you that. <laughs> so, I spoke highly of you too. Yeah, but how good was it? <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> After '72, I go on. <laughs> Yeah. The other thing I just want everybody to know, uh, never would have got to go to those World Series, never would have, you know, I just met a, lot, met a lot of great people, and a lot of them are sitting right here, and there's more of you out there that we talked a little earlier. You know, there's something to be said about the sport and what we get out of it. I was telling someone earlier today, we were probably having some of the best times in our lives, working our butt off, and never even realized how much fun we were having. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it, the it sport was means the best time it really means a lot to me. And, you know, just, uh, I want to thank all these sponsors that helped me out through, like the rest of the one. And this guy. <laughs> don't get around to the old <laughs> And now what? You ain't no different. Well, he was always pretty nice guy, but these two are gangsters. <laughs> shot, what do you call that? Shot sheet? Was that with the shot sheet? I jumped into bed one night, my knees coming up my chin. Shot sheet, cheek, cheek.
Dad is his eyes sheep together somehow and shot him out. I just want to say, you know, I would have been to St. Paul and all these other places that we went if it hadn't been for the strong backbone of Timberland machines and the people that stood behind the sport all up through the years. So. It's, uh, it was a great company in Lancaster, Mrs. and Daly. Yep. Yep, no doubt about it. Thank you. Mr. Herb Yancey. You know, uh, every Hall of Fame has to have, the, you know, the rest of them, you know, they, they all deserve to be in the Hall of Fame big time. Everybody here deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, but you know, the Music Hall of Fame has Elvis Presley. <laughs> you know, uh, the, uh, the NASCAR Hall of Fame has Richard Petty. Uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame has Babe Ruth. Are you ready for this? <laughs> Herb Yancey, inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame, 2019. Herb's racing career spans 30 years from 1964 to 1994. He wore USSA gold bibs number 2, 3, 7, and 20. In 1970, Herb raced for Pennsylvania Art of Cat distributor Penn Arctic. He then began racing for Team Abo, which soon became the most successful team in the history of Eastern Snowmobile Racing in 1975 became the only independent driver ever to win a snow pro race, beating the factory teams in the 650 class at the 1974 World Series at Eagle River, Wisconsin. He beat the snow pro guys. <laughs> at Peterborough, Ontario in 1975, Herb won the 440 class in the professional driver's circuit both days. He also won a Kilkenny Cup in Mod 2 at the 1975 Lancaster Grand Prix. Oh, really? Counting a 74 win, Herb has won six World Series events. He won three first at the 1977 World Series in Weedsport, New York, and took two more at the 1978 World Series in West Yellowstone, Montana, winning in both the 440 Supermod in the 440 Acts. For his effort, he was voted star of the series. Out of the 99 events Herb entered in 1977, he won 77 of them. Wow. Herb won the coveted Adirondack Cup in 1978 and became driver of the year for, 19, for the 1978 season. In all, Herb Yancey garnered an amazing number of trophies estimated to be between 1,200 and 1,500 during his racing career. His record as an independent non-factory snowmobile racer is unmatched by anyone's standard and may never be surpassed. Ladies and gentlemen, please bow or curtsy. <laughs> saying that it's uh, snowmobile racing has always been a big part of my life. It was probably the number one thing that I ever wanted to do from the time I was about uh, 14 years old and rode on my first snowmobile. And it uh, had a, a, a long and uh, diverse road that I followed and uh, I, I don't know quite what to say other than I just appreciate uh, all the support that I had over the years and I can't uh, begin to thank everybody but I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, I was just a, a farm kid that uh, didn't, didn't have much but I knew that uh, 
I want him to go fast. I just I love, I love the, the speed that I can obtain on anything uh, that I ever uh, was aboard. And uh, a local dealer, our cat dealer, Dick Granny from Casterland, New York, uh, knew that I liked snowmobiles and I was pretty good at it. Uh, so he offered me a ride the first year. And uh, he didn't have anybody to ride the big sleds and he knew I liked speed. So he put me on a 634 Puma right out of the gate and I went to a race, I, I came over to Lee, Massachusetts, and we went to a race, and uh, we did pretty good, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, on top of uh, the field, because there was a lot of tough competition over here. And uh, uh, then, I think the next weekend, we went to the New York State Fairgrounds, and all the factories were there. And I, I found out at that point that I had some talent and I had some uh, ability to compete with the big boys. I remember Yvon Duhamo, I raced it. He was in the class with me in the 650 class. And make a long story short, I wound up placing third against the factories way back then on my first uh, early beginning. But uh, there's a long road after that, uh, once I got done with the, the dealer racing for uh, Rennie Sales and Service, uh, I moved to New Jersey. And I didn't know what I was going to do in New Jersey uh, as far as soul set racing because there was no, no races there. So I got hooked up with the Pennsylvania distributor in Penn Art. <coughs> And uh, they didn't have any big sled drivers either, so they were glad to me, welcome me on board. So I raced all over Pennsylvania until 1974, and uh, had quite a lot of good success, and uh, run into a lot of tough drivers down in that neighborhood. <clears throat> uh, then uh, I. Uh, as uh, one of the people were mentioning, uh, the sponsorship or the dealers or distributors were getting uh, acquired by Nero Equipment. Uh, they acquired Rodco in New England here, and then they acquired the following year, they acquired Henari. So at the end of the 74 year, I was uh, done with my sponsorship again. So I went to Eagle River for the uh, Snowmobile Race World Series that year. And I was gonna run against the Snow Pro because I uh, didn't, I always lagged a few points from being in the top 10. So I missed my invitation in 74. And when I got out there, I said, well, I can run, I can run uh, against the factories. So I signed up. And in the afternoon, uh, early afternoon, uh, we had the, the snow pro there, the elite show. So I was signed up in that class, so I went out and practiced on the racetrack. Well, my sled broke down because it wasn't uh, up to par. So uh, the night before at the restaurant, uh, Team Abel, Bill Abel, offered me one of their sleds. And I said, uh, no, I'll ride mine. So I rode mine and it broke down. So then, after it broke down, I said, well, there's one chance I can still get in. So I run over to Team Abel's bus, and I said, uh, is that sled available? And they said, sure, but we're busy with Ron Hall's sled because he's, he's our main concern. And I said, well, I understand, so I, I will work at it and see if I can get it put together. They had it all pieced out, rabbit parts for this and that, and uh, uh, they said, we brought it along, we weren't going to run it, but it's here, you can, you can take it. So I uh, got it all put together, and uh, uh, by the way, it was Chip Elwood's sled, it was freshly put together, 
because he didn't get it uh, put together early in the season, so it was all fresh. And then it was, uh, I, I, I took it into the pit, and in them days, they used to lock the pit gates. Once you went in, you couldn't go back out to get a part or a spark plug or anything. So you had to take everything you needed into the locked pits. And uh, by then, Ronnie was done with his class, so all of uh, Team Abel's mechanics jumped right on the sled, and we finished putting it together in the pits. And so the first time that I rode that sled was when I pulled on the line in the heat race with all the tractor drivers. And never, never sat on it before, but it was such a well-prepared prepared sled that I went out there and I placed third. It was enough to turn over into the semi. And I said, if we can get this sled tuned up just a little bit more, I said, I think I can uh, really place in this race. This race. And it was, it, it was so much better than my sled that I just uh, was just like I was tuned for it. <laughs> I took it into the corners so hard that uh, everyone thought I was going to crash every every lap going in and I would slide right up to the wall within a foot of the wall and then charge back down through and I remember the race quite uh, vividly uh, Charlie Lofton was ahead of me I, I got out in the feature uh, just um, just about third and then picked them off one by one by about the sixth lap I was ready to go into the lead and I took the lead and I said uh, well Charlie Lofton was who I was dueling with he pulled back by me and then the next lap I went by him again and then I never seen him again I said I wonder what happened <laughs> well I don't know I guess something give out on the sled but then I was out front all by myself and won the race. So that, that was uh, one of the highlights of my career is uh, beating the factory uh, with the big machine against those seasoned drivers and all the uh, budget they had. And that was, that was, that was just, I can't, I can't say how much uh, that was a highlight. And uh, so then the rest, uh, I got invited to join Team Abel uh, for the coming seasons. And that's when my career really took off and I had mechanics helping me. It wasn't a, it wasn't a one man show anymore and we had good support. And so I, I owe so much to Team Abel and the whole crew, Ronnie and Chip and the, the mechanics. Uh, that just made everything possible. Uh, it left me more time to concentrate on driving, and it, as some of you probably know, I was a pretty intense driver. I was, I was all business, and when I went to the races, there was no monkey business. Everything was serious. Yeah. So I, I just uh, I could go on and on about a lot of stories. <laughs> and if you want to talk to me one on one or anytime, I'm available to correspond with any or everyone because the sport will give me so much in my life uh, that I can I can never repay what I owe. <laughs> Every one of these for each one of the in their face. 
You really did a wonderful no, job. Oh, yeah. 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 today of 2019. I uh, was very honored to, and, and privileged to be able to uh, accept the award today. Uh, met a lot of guys here, done a lot of talking, uh, reminiscing, so they all told a few lies. I uh, had a great time. Uh, I've had people say to me, and since I've got down in 8081, uh, you know, if you had to do all over again, would you do it? And I always answer with this, and I had to be, but I don't want to be my age now starting out. I want to be younger, than, back when I was young again. But I uh, met a lot of great people doing this uh, 12 or 13 year run I had. Still stay in touch with some, got some of the past. Uh, but the great camaraderie that we had amongst us all, uh, like on a Saturday night or a Saturday afternoon, the racing was all over. We were in a motor home or my old school bus or somebody's camper or whatever and reminisce in the day or maybe the week before over maybe a beer or two and uh, go out to dinner and yeah. of course every night we didn't get back to bed at nine o'clock like we we're supposed to either too probably. we really we gained a camaraderie that we all had the same thing in mind you know uh, we're there to beat each other during Saturday and yeah Saturday they some qualified for the Sundays and again Sunday we do it all over again for the features but uh, the Friday and the Saturday nights and the Sunday We'll say uh, when they've given out the awards and stuff, we were, it didn't make any difference what color jacket we had on. We all, we all uh, sat around a round table, uh, 
two or three of them and waited our turn if it was our turn on that given weekend. But uh, uh, I guess it was a part of our life that, uh, like I said today, we were having the, some of the best times in our life and we didn't even know it at the time. So uh, I just had a lot of fun, met a lot of nice people. And we enjoyed uh, the travel, meeting the people. I was, there was places like Eagle River, Wisconsin, and uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and some of these other places that we went to World Series, and Weechport, New York, and I probably never would have got to those places. It wasn't the wintertime, but uh, I wouldn't have got to those places if it hadn't been for the people that stood behind me, as I spoke about today. Uh, as you know, when you travel like that, you need you need help, unless, unless you're unless you can back yourself. I had four kids, I couldn't. Sure. But I was very uh, very fortunate to uh, have some people that really helped me out a lot, and I, I appreciate everything they had done for me. Wonderful. Uh, just uh, like Herbie Angie said today, uh, there's no way I could ever repay back the favors that have been given to me. I thought that was a good statement that he made. Yeah, for sure. So, well, good. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ron Hall. I race snowmobiles uh, from uh, 1970 to 76, 77. Uh, I never was one for speed. I didn't like fast cars or anything like that. But uh, my next door neighbor, uh, Jimmy Fonger, which uh, was an uh, excellent racer, uh, I started going, hanging around with him and changing spark plugs at a race and stuff, got interested in it, and it kind of caught on. I never set on a snowmobile till. I was probably 27 years old, and uh, I uh, started out with skidoos for one year. Got a, uh, offered a ride on a snow jet uh, in uh, let's see, 73, I guess it was, and, and uh, did real good with that. And then uh, Bill Abel uh, from AMP Auto Parts called me up uh, for, to run a 73 Rump Magnum. And uh, uh, so I, I said, okay, and that, uh, you know, it sounded like a good offer. And we raced that and did real well with it. Uh, we ended up uh, uh, winning uh, Malone, the Northeastern Championships at Malone, the half mile horse track. And we went on to Boonville, and it was a 440. And we entered it in the 650 class at Boonville. They had the Adir fame Adirondack Cup there, and uh, so I raced against all the 650s and uh, ended up winning it. Uh, later on and down the road, uh, Herbie Ancy was my teammate on, on, uh, on uh, Team Abel, and uh, he was he got second in that race. And uh, the next year, I ran the. Uh, the Adirondack Cup in uh, 74, and uh, I uh, they put it into the 440 class, but uh, we had prepared a 650 to go back after it again, and I, I won the 650 class that year. I had a 650, I won it, but uh, so that was two years in a row that I won the 650 class there, but they moved it into the four. They were moving it into the class with the most sleds. They so uh, I didn't win the 440 that year, so. The next year, I had a uh, three super mods. I went back in the I went back in '75 and won three super mod classes, winning the cup again. So I had I got I got two of the uh, Adirondack cups at home, and they're, they're they're over over six foot tall. They're a they're a big trophy wow. and uh, my prized possessions. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, that was that was uh, one of the you know high, highlights of my career. I'd won uh, you know World Series classes, classes and stuff. But uh, one of probably one of the biggest highlights was uh, uh, they had a regular snowmobile program at Weedsport, New York. Uh, they had the factories were there. They had a special uh, class that you qualified during the year. You had to win a, a 440 Supermod class to qualify for this. It was a 50 lap class that they put up quite a bit of money into. And uh, 
they left 10 positions open and the factories and stuff could come out and qualify. They had the twin track man is there and they had the Arctic Cat factory was there. And we raced a whole program all day long. Uh, you know, I raced a 250 class, I raced a 440 class, I raced a 440X. And, uh, you know, normally, you know, we had some light and tracks and stuff trying to go fast. So, you know, with all that racing and then plus the 50 laps, we, uh, my son spent quite a few days building a heavy duty track. It was nothing, it wasn't anything trick track or anything like that. It was heavy and, you know, for a trail riding event. You know, and that's what I raced all day long. And, and we ended up, uh, they had 25 sleds. They were parked, uh, it was a Le Mans start. They parked them on a 45 degree angle on the infield. And we'd back up against the grandstands the grandstands counted down, you know, nine, eight, seven, six. And some of the guys took off on four. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I got over there, and you, you had to stick your tether switch on, and, and uh, you could have a mechanic pull it for you. And uh, my wife's uncle, he was, uh, you know, starting a sled for me. And we, we started off, and, and uh, I think it was 20, they had a, a lap counter because it was a stock car track on so you knew your how many laps you, you could completed and uh, I think by the 20th lap I lapped all the factories by that time wow. <laughs> but I went on I went on to win it and uh, it was a you know it was one of my hi highlights that I really enjoyed you know? yeah yeah but, that's uh, amazing yeah so that uh, you know and just it, people you know, you don't realize how many, you know, how much fun we had back then. Uh, the amount of people that would come to those races, uh, you know, they didn't have the sports programs and stuff on television or the cables and the, all that kind of stuff. I mean, everybody, I, snowmobiling really hit with a crash, you know. I mean, people, you know, they had two snowmobiles. They might not have a car, but they had two yeah. snowmobiles, you know. They had they their priorities their right. Whole, whole families <laughs> for the weekend. You know, and, and uh, you know, we would uh, race, and you'd, at Boonville, they'd have 880, uh, eight, 900 entries, entries, you know, and you, know, you come away from there with a win. You know, you, you knew you were real lucky, and you knew you had real good equipment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you had to have both. And it was a, a, a ball racing against the same guys. We, we've got to be friends every week, you know, that you were... You were down to business to serious on the track, but then afterwards, you know, they're you're the best of friends. The know? real community. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I, yeah. I really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Claude Bear. I uh, started uh, racing motor skis back in '64 when the '65 models came out, and little did we know at that time what we were really into. We didn't even know that this industry was going to be what it is today. I think none of us really realized the industry was going to grow the way it has. If we hadn't, maybe we'd have done things a little bit differently. But in any case, uh, it was exciting because we were young, we wanted to go fast. And uh, when the motor ski dealer in Colebrook offered me a ride, well, you know, what the hell, it's this sled. You don't have to worry about beating mine up. And then I was pretty good on the sled, so then. Uh, I got an offer from Rockwell Distributors out of Yar Yarmouth, Maine. And uh, so they hired me and I went racing and sales and raced every weekend and then salesman during the week. Time went on. This was, I worked for Rockwell for about 10 years. In the first five years, racing and sales. And then after that, after the accident in Lancaster, they told me that I was too valuable to be on the racetrack, they wanted me in the office tending to sales. So from 71 on, it was strictly New England sales manager. And we had guys that were going to just race and beat the sleds up on weekends. <laughs> so that, that was uh, my introduction to the racing and to the competition out in the field through motor ski. And then, of course, Bombardier bought motor ski and things were changing rapidly at that point to where Rockwell was no longer going to be a distributor, so I moved on to another brand, and uh, 
never raced the other brands, but was always involved with the other brands in one form or another of promoting, uh, developing, testing, and things like that. So the snowmobile industry was very good to me for 18 years that I was in it. So today I kind of look back on that with fond memories, especially with what they have done here at Cranes, that they took the time and the initiative to bring back the memories of yesterday. I think it's a great job. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. I uh, can't be thankful enough to uh, this organization, Paul Crane and Midge, and his other associates, uh, which I don't personally know, but this is a great thing for snowmobiling and uh, the vintage aspect of it. It's just uh, uh, phenomenal that I, I am a part of that. Uh, I, I feel honored to be uh, inducted into this year's uh, inductees. I have so many people to thank that it's, it's hard to go through and mention them all. Sure. But uh, I, so, snowmobile is so much of my part of, part of my life. Well, all these uh, stories, like I mentioned in the uh, uh, presentation, sure. I always loved running against the factory. Because they're the best, they got the best budget. Uh, they're if you could even stay with them, that's such an honor. Sure. And uh, I I loved it when they would uh, when we'd pull in, especially with Team Able. I've heard this quote many times, uh, and I've read it in print in the uh, Warriors of Winter that there comes that Team Able and that damn Yancey. <laughs> <laughs> so. That, that kind of tickles my fancy, nice. and I, I just uh, love racing against them because they're the best of the best. And So where does that put me? I, I'm right there in the same category. Nice. And, uh, it's nice to have that feeling. Yeah, for sure. To, to know uh, that you're that caliber. Yeah, and, and that people are still thinking about it this, these many years later. Yes, and uh, I didn't realize it until just recent years digging up all this old stuff that I was just one uh, driver that was, uh, they loved to watch race because I was so animated and all over that sled. I did whatever I needed to. I, I could jump on printer any sled and uh, bring it in even if it didn't have uh, a track record of being a winner. Uh, it was... Uh, so great to get the most potential out of a, a unit when uh, uh, you were you're on it. And I ran various sleds for various people over the years. And some of them I said, I don't know how the driver could drive that sled. But I would still get it around. And, nice. Uh, it was uh, it's just such a honor to be recognized for what's going on now, the resurgence in this vintage uh, uh, program. So I just talked to Mark Bellinger, and he did Midge's sled, restored it with uh, two other guys, his son and another guy, and they're getting involved in the uh, vintage racing. So I'm sure we're going to have uh, a good association because he does just a super job restoring his sleds and making them uh, look great. Oh, I did that crash up here. Ready? Here's a bull. Here's a bull. Oh, Frank and a bull. And, uh... Oh, wow. Beautiful job, Mark. Dude, you gotta kill him. Wow. Put it on Facebook, bitch. What did they do to it, bitch? Get on it. Wow. Get on it. That thing is so clean. Oh my god. Put your feet on the runner, boy. So you're the first one to sit on it. I ran my feet off the runner, boy. Look at me, dear. Perfect. An inch? I got an empty trailer over there. You can put that in there. I had Conrad make the seat with three extra pleats in it. Get you up on the handlebars. Oh, man. <laughs> it's perfect. I'm not putting my feet on the running board, so. Wow. Oh, man.
of simplicity and ingenuity. The newest way to load, unload, and transport your ATV or UTV. The MadRamps Pivoting Ramp System. Made in the USA and engineered for strength and durability. Maneuver through tight places and over rugged terrain with plenty of ground clearance. No licensing, no ongoing maintenance costs, and no storage hassles like trailers. Won't slip or move like conventional ramps. Free up more cargo space in the bed of your truck. 
securely connects to your truck's receiver hitch, easily extends for safe loading and unloading, seamlessly retracts for highway and off-road travel, DOT approved in all 50 states and Canada, quickly disconnects in under a minute. A unique space-saving storage system. The Madlands Pivoting Ramp System. Go farther. Go faster. Go safer. When you order using the link in the description, I'll send you three free vintage snowmobile DVDs. When you order using the link in the description, I'll send you three free vintage snowmobile DVDs.